I'm so excited to welcome you here and to have a conversation about your journey because you have quite a remarkable journey. You started your business back in 2004, correct? Yes, correct. And your business partner, you and Lindsay, you went to Cornell together and you were both working full time in fashion. And then you had this idea to start a detergent company while you were working at yes, Ralph Lauren. Correct. How did that yes. happen? So um, we were amassing our wardrobes primarily with sample sales. And uh, at Ralph Lauren, I was previous to that the cashmere bar girl, so I had a fair amount of cashmere sweaters as well. And um, I was driving around the city with my boss um, in a town car, which would now be an Uber. <laughs> but at the time, when I was telling him about all my laundry problems, how I had all these cashmere sweaters, and there was nothing to wash it with, and everything said dry clean, and I knew we didn't need to dry clean because we went to Cornell and we were textile majors. We were textile majors, so we knew that the wool did, could be washed and didn't need to be dry cleaned, and the silks could be washed, and et cetera, et cetera. And this was sort of the advent of the jeans that now are $100. A t-shirt was no longer a three-pack in a plastic bag. It was like $60. And um, there was no way that that was going to be compromised by yellow pit stains. And so I'm telling him about all my laundry problems. And I said, you know, I just need a place where I could take everything and I could have this hand wash and have this air dry and have products used specifically for, for what they needed. And he turns to me and he says, Gwen, it sounds like the laundress. And I'm like, yes, exactly. It is, it is exactly the laundress. So fast forward, um, a couple of weeks later, I show up on a Monday morning from my desk, and there is a photocopy, uh, uh, a tape to my computer monitor, highlighted and circled, how to start your own laundromat, left by my boss. So that, Had you thought of starting your own business before, or he put this idea in your head? No, so I always knew that I had the entrepreneurial spirit. I um, studied apparel design, but I peppered my curriculum with um, marketing at the hotel school. I took Ben Daniels' uh, entrepreneurship and enterprise. Uh, so I was padding or creating my own entrepreneurship curriculum in 1998. <laughs> uh, to, so I would be more prepared. That I, was, I knew that I just wasn't going to be designer forever. I had this I, you know, I had a necktie business when I was in high school. I, I knew that there was. You had it in you. I had it in yeah. me. I had it in me, and um, this was a common thread that Lindsay and I both shared, where we both, um, in college, we had, you know, started a business plan for another company that we uh, did some R and D work right after graduation, um, and she started her first job, and of course, I was a designer, so I didn't have a recruited job to start. <laughs> um, so that was a commonality between the two of us, in which we also had our, our complementary skill sets, the design, and, and she was the apparel management. Which is very important in a business partnership. Correct. <laughs> Correct. We, we, we have seen uh, partnerships where you have two designers. No one needs two designers. <laughs> you need a, a balanced... Uh, Support, you know, two different skill sets to, to give. Definitely, don't need the overlap. So now your boss puts this sticker, sticker on your on, desk. Sticker on, yeah, sticker on. I sign up for laundry class. He even offers to pay, and I was like, no, it's okay, I can take this one. <laughs> and um, go off to class on how to start a laundromat, which was really informative. Um, how long is that class? It was like an evening class, like okay. a learning annex. Okay. It was like a three-hour course. The last, the last question from the classroom was, what kind of licenses you needed for a gun. And I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> this is done for you. <laughs> I was like, okay, note to self. <laughs> so then how did you go from taking this course to figuring out how to now develop this business? So from, from that class, and then I circled back with Lindsay, and I was like, how do you feel about laundry? <laughs> so uh, we, we partnered up really quickly. It wasn't much of a, a, an arm twist to get her on board for that because she also had her, um, her career and she was traveling for Chanel and dumping her suitcase weekly and 
literally dumping that suitcase where she had a dry cleaner at the bottom of her building and $300 later repacking. And it was like, you know, this was just not economically feasible. It was a waste of money. It was gross. You know, all those things that are associated with dry cleaning. Um, and so it, it wasn't long. It wasn't, it wasn't, we have a very Cornell centric story where from concept to, to agreement to move forward after the laundry course of getting my feet wet or hands wet. <laughs> um, then I dusted off that, that entrepreneurship and enterprise uh, book where every, everyone writes a business plan in that course that I had kept and uh, sent an email to a professor at Cornell who I knew because during my four years, she was the, the um, dean of our department, but I just knew that she was the fiber science expert and in detergency. So I sent her an email and I said, hey, um, Professor Opendorf, you, you don't really know us. We were apparel majors in management, but um, would you mind, we're, we're, we're interested in starting a, a company. We want to make laundry detergent. And uh, and would you would you be interested in meeting with us? And she said, absolutely. Come up to Ithaca. I can't wait. This is so exciting. <laughs> Send me a list of all your questions. So uh, Lindsay and I had our, our literal laundry list of questions on what what was this? Why was it blue? What does this ingredient say? What's you know this whole 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 list? And um, we sent it up in advance, and we show up. And we had been out of school for about five years, so showing up in a classroom in July was like daunting in itself. And she's like, "Where would you girls like to start?" And here's the t the pile of textbooks, like as wide as the stage, stacked high. And we're like, with sticky notes coming out of all the pages. <laughs> and we're like, "Oh my gosh, back to Cornell, we are." <laughs> so, uh, hey, Professor Obendorf did not give anything away. We had a crash course weekend in detergency where uh, we had a very specific uh, mission to learn what we wanted to, but we knew fundamentally what we wanted. We wanted something for a wool and cashmere. We wanted something for, for, for silk and synthetics. We wanted to get rid of that pit stain. We wanted um, to, to preserve the color in our jeans and air dry them and not have them crunchy and stiff. You know, so we had this whole goal list. So um, I still have the m file boxes of all of the photocopies from all of those textbooks that we spent the every night photocopying at Kinko's. <laughs> that is quite a story and really incredible. So now you've become experts in detergent in a weekend. Correct. Yeah. And you decide, okay, now we need to start figuring out these formulations and we're going to start this company. And you didn't raise any money. You bootstrapped the company, correct? Right. So it, we had a two-year process between 2002 where we registered the company and launched in 2004. So within the, those two years uh, of working full-time, Luckily, our offices were two blocks away, so we would do like file handoffs uh, at the ATM machine, like a block in between us, or we would pop into the Four Seasons Hotel in the lobby and have a micro meeting, <laughs> or you know, just passing in the wind or leaving things at the the doorman lobby. You know, it was like a whole operation, and this is also, mind you, um, not as sophisticated of all of our channels of communication. You know, it, I, I didn't, we didn't have our own personal email addresses. And, it, you know, I have faxes back and forth from our various business trips from Paris and Italy and faxing label copy and all these things. So within that time period, we, we started with the business plan before we even knew how to make soap. And so that was crystal clear of what the plan was, what the mission was, what we wanted, what we needed, the whole marketing strategy. Um, what was the marketing strategy back then? <laughs> the marketing strategy was to, to make incredible product that we needed, and we felt that if we needed, then everyone else needed them as well. The irony is that we started a detergent company with neither of us having a laundry 
laundry machine or washing oh, machine yeah. or dryer. City. Yes, New York City. And I actually had this conversation with someone, oh, if I did my own laundry, maybe I'd use your product. And I said, well, I started the company without you know, having a washing machine. So the, the products are really designed that you could hand wash and machine wash and drop off to the fluff and fold around the corner and have it used outside, outside it as well. Um, so within that time span, we applied for an SBA loan. So our biggest raise was a $100,000 SBA loan. And you never ended up raising any other money after that. So <laughs> recently, you did sell the company. Yes. Congratulations. Thank you. Was Thank that you. always in your business plan? Yes, it was in the business plan. But we actually, th we, but it was in the business plan that happened on year five, not year 15. <laughs> So how did 2008 you happened, you know, some things that weren't in the business plan happened. <laughs> what made you keep going all of those years where you, you were just not going to give up until you sold the business? Yeah, and it was an organic journey. So um, there are other ways to, to fund a company and, and raise a company. And neither of us were, were from VC or had banking backgrounds. So raising the money wasn't natural to us. What was natural was bi building and creating and, and honing our community and our sales channels. And from the very beginning, we started with e-commerce, which is a, a whole nother story. It was like a fake commerce that really didn't work, but no one knew it didn't work um, until they got a phone call from, from Lindsay or myself saying, hi, thank you for your order, but can you just give me your credit card now? <laughs> So we didn't have a payment gateway from the beginning. Um, you have to start somewhere. I know. Now it's a plug-in, so a lot of my stories sound so archaic. But at the time, it, it was a major investment of a payment gateway. Uh, and then we sold, and we had B to B, so we were selling wholesale to stores in the U.S. And we were also a global business from our first trade show, where we were shipping to Hong Kong and to London. So we started. Luckily, while we were small, we started with this sort of three-prong sales channel journey. Um, we raised money through something called Plastic, which is credit cards. Um, at the time, it, it, you know, there was, oh, well, you're a female entrepreneur. It's so easy to get money. It's flying from the sky. <laughs> so not the case. It was like you could get $10,000 with a 10% APR from some fund, which was not flying from the sky and was so not a good deal. Um, but American Express would give you 25000 and 0%. <laughs> How long did they give you the 0% for? A year? Uh, until 2008, when we had a total of a quarter million dollars of credit card debt and a beautiful envelope in our office that we called the graveyard that had about 20 maxed out credit cards. <laughs> So that would give anyone anxiety. How did you keep going through all of that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a little, you, yes. I, uh, my mom never knew about that debt until the last Cornell event from November. She never knew I, that was part of that. What was did she say life. to you after that event? In the audience, she was like, <gasps> <laughs> She's like, I knew you had debt, but not like that. Well, the good news is you sold your company. Yes, I sold the company. <laughs> And what I want to hear a little bit about, because I know a lot of people in the audience who are starting businesses are also creating business plans where they're looking to eventually exit or sell their company. Can you share some lessons learned from selling your business? Because it's quite a journey and process. Yeah, I wish, I wish I could say that there was a playbook because Lindsay and I exhaustedly asked for the playbook to anyone that we could ask. And everyone's like, oh, well, it's so different. Every deal is so different. We're like, can you give us some process, some some step-by-step, -step, 10 pointers, like how this works, what goes on. There's no selling your business for dummies book. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> apparently, I mean, I guess there is. I could be curious to read it. Um, but everyone kept saying, oh, everything's so different. It depends, it depends, it depends. Um, and luckily, we never had to do the, the pitch series. We never had to do the road show. We never did that for raising money, and we didn't do it for the, for the sale either. Um, as, as true product people and builders, uh, the, the greatest thing that we did for our brand was we built our store, which was uh, always in the original business plan. And the original business plan to this day is still ironclad of all of the things we wanted to accomplish, all the products we wanted to make, all the markets we wanted to be in, um, all of the 
the, everything is in that original plan and all we had to do is assign dates of execution and revenue attached. So, and it's not like we were looking at it weekly or yearly, it was just so ingrained of what the vision of our brand was and what we wanted to accomplish that it was just continue to, to, to build and, and grow and, and execute on that vision as we could organically. So um, about five years ago, we finally had uh, enough ex, you know, little pile of pennies in the bank to, uh, we had to make a decision because every year we were investing in something, you know, investing in the new website, investing in, uh, we never paid any um, investments for, for media or paid advertisement. So usually it was a website <laughs> expense that was happening. And then we were like, okay, this is the year for the store. And the store was really important for us because we wanted our vision in a experience. We wanted people to really understand our brand and really understand what we were doing and be able to come smell, see, wash, demonstrate, and understand the, that world of the laundress that we created. And um, what came along with that, which we figured was sort of, I say, we hung the fly paper out. So assuming that if people could really understand and feel our vision, then someone would walk in from um, a company that we wanted them to walk in from. And, um, and did that happen? And it happened. And uh, it happened so literally. I didn't actually expect it to be so literally, where he actually walked in the store and said, hi, I'm from Unilever. <laughs> Who can I talk to? And I was like, this is so weird. I mean, I wanted this to happen, but not exactly in this way. <laughs> Um, so, so that was the, the beginning of the, that conversation. It was um, not, I guess, in the playbook where it took 13 months start to finish. Um, what does a sale typically take? Did you hear from other people? Uh, apparently that's really long. And it, they usually go stale and die within 13 months. So it, it was an incredible process. Um, but we, we, were, we were Cornell girls. We were super organized. I had files r marked and ready to go from, for 15 years. <laughs> so uh, Ready from year five. I was ready. ready. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, literally on like Christmas Eve to not this last Christmas or the Christmas before, I was literally dumping the filing cabinets, sending it to scan for, for PwC uh, audit compliance or due diligence. Um, it was a, it was an epic Christmas. <laughs> what did that moment feel like when you heard the deal finally went through? Well, it was so long. It was on and off again so many times. But at the end, you're just like nail biting. You know, is this really going to happen? Um, so by the time it happens, you're just like you're emotionally all over the place. Where, you know, no one's crying a river for me. But it was not. It was. It wasn't. It, it was painful. <laughs> How have your roles changed now since you've been acquired? So um, everyone, Unilever is the first person to say that, that they challenge with these acquisitions and they're, they're, um, the aftermath isn't exactly smooth, but they're learning. <laughs> so uh, it's just, it's been interesting um, just in sort of some logistical bank accounts and you know really basic things. But, um, you know, just sort of um, continuing and growing with the, the company and sort of my role now is really, is really growing and empowering and creating my legacy for the company to, to run independent in the future. That's really exciting. Yeah. My last question yeah. for you. I know we could sit up here and talk probably for hours about oh, yeah. this. But, but everyone can listen on, our, on the podcast. This is true. So Gwen is going to be on the episode of our podcast. I think it's coming out the week after next. But everyone's going to subscribe so they'll know anyway. Yes, they'll know. Yes, you'll get the <laughs> notification. You'll hear the whole 50-minute story of, of Gwen's journey. Um, what advice can you share with entrepreneurs who are here today? Looking back at your journey, maybe there's something you wish you had known when you first started. <sighs> You know, I, I think the, the, it, this, the whole journey was so easy because I was so passionate about the project. I was passionate about the product, passionate about the brand, passionate about the business. Um, there was no chance of it not succeeding. 
um, I knew that our product worked and that every single person who tried it and used it had the same reaction. So it wasn't like you're selling something that's not great. Like that's a different situation. Um, and just really, there was there was no option to fail. It just you just keep on going and keep on going. And if you have that passion and belief and love what you do and love your product and love your business, then it's easy. It's easy to ride the dead, and it's easy, you know, not really easy, but it's easier, um, you know, to work hard and 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 take those risks. Take out some credit cards. Take out some credit cards. <laughs> Um, and, you know, make it happen, yeah. yeah. Such, such great advice. Thank you so much for sharing your journey and story with everyone.